Hi everybody, welcome to the Sphere IT podcast. Uh, we're filming this live in the InsureTech Insights London 2024. Today I've invited Chris Woodward um, to the podcast to talk about his background and his experience in the insurance market. Chris and I kind of know each other, actually live in the same town. We do actually, yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, we've done a bit of work together in the past and I'm really glad to have you on the podcast. So Chris, for everyone's benefit, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I'm uh, head of engineering, head of data engineering for Convex, uh, which is a, uh, a, a specialty insurance company uh, working out of London as Bermuda and some other places. Uh, I've been in data uh, as pretty much everything from analyst, architect, engineer, you know, person who moves Excels around um, for about 20 years. So I've been working in data and seen it come from something which is very much, the, you know, the old MI Excel world into something where, you know, we're now talking about generative AI and all of those kind of good things. Yes, and, it's a, it's a, it, and over those 20 years, which makes me, when I think about it, feel like an old man. <laughs> um, so we are. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, kind of, I, I think, wow, we've come a long way in a very, very short time, which is great. Sure. Fantastic. Sure. So you started life as a programmer, really? Um, in an uh, no, or? not really. I mean, I, I started life just as a, an analyst, as I say, just the kind of person who produced it, produced, produced it, uh, produces the reports for you know, insurance managers and things like that, operations managers. And back when I started, it was you get a feed from it, you, know, you get something in it. Uh, from a system and you kind of manipulate it in Excel and then there's probably a that PDA. That still happens, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from, not while I'm in charge, it doesn't. Um, so, you know, um, you know, something that is Excel and manipulation and then gets published to somewhere. And from there, I, you know, the natural progression of analysts is to kind of get hold of something like SQL Server and do a data warehouse on that. And then you kind of move into, you get kicked upstairs after a while or kicked into architecture. And both of those things happened to me. Yeah, uh, okay. and, uh, <laughs> and leadership as well. But yeah, big, big data. Big data happened around the same time. I was sort of was riding that wave, really. I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky. No one's found me out yet. To escape that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's what you say about Convex. I understand it's a uh, you know, born digital native insurer, yeah. very modern. Yeah. Got some great leadership, you included, um, in the organization. <laughs> Thank and, you. And, you know, from the outside looking in, it looks like a very special place to work. Yeah, um, it is, yeah. So looking at the technology that you've worked with in the past and the technology that you're currently working with now, you know, I, I assume the gap is vast. Yes. Um, but these other companies want to catch up with, you might have worked for some other insurers in the past, and, yes. but they've got massive legacy hangovers yes, yeah, and things like yeah, that. So yeah, yeah. what advice would you give those companies right now in the data world? Where would they start to go on that journey in, in, in your, in your to modern world? The data world, the considerations of a sort of data lake haven't necessarily... The term, the term lake, warehouse, lake house is slightly abused in many places. And I'm not too sure the considerations of doing it well of... of really changed uh, all that much um, other than the fact that people were doing lakes and things like that you still have to essentially get all your data into one place into the most efficient way possible and uh, essentially categorize catalog that data make sure you're handling it appropriately being very careful with it being very uh, having the right governance framework those other kind of things i think the challenge with you talking about uh, legacy companies is obviously simply that extraction process. Uh, Convex is very, very lucky. We, we, as you rightly said, we don't really have a legacy estate, but we really have the same sort of complexity of um, data collection, structured data, unstructured data from systems that are, you know, sometimes RDBMSs, sometimes push out like events, sometimes APIs, all those other kind of good things. The important principle for the, the lake house is that all of that data is processed to a place where it's consumable and it allows people to you know, have self-service moments with it and it allows for that experimentation and allows people to you know not just sort of people like me sort of slightly nerdy engineering types but people who actually understand really the underwriting or the finance or the claims process to get hold of that data and uh, begin to experiment with it and that's very much our focus and that really is uh, so, you know, that really is the kind of way you derive value. It's about not making it just a concern of, as I say, the, the, uh, the, 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 te the, not the tech savvy, because everyone, I think everyone's tech savvy, but the coder. It's not just the focus of the coder anymore. It's the focus of a bunch of other people. But 
the principles of a lake house about making that data understandable and consumable uh, in a way that abstracts away all of that kind of technical complexity. That's key. That really is key. So going down that kind of self-service platform for the user route. Yeah, I think so. And it's not just one self-service tool. There's very different types of self-service. I think the important thing is, you know, make there are industry, you know, the kind of like subject matter experts who will be able to use the data of varying shapes, sizes, as long as, as I say, it is handled appropriately and carefully by those ingestion pipelines. And there's other things that the data engineers will pull together. Um, and working in collaboration across data teams, uh, like the one I work in, and you know functional SMEs to deliver something that has real value in whatever tool is most appropriate, sure. whatever tool is best. Sure, know. sure. I mean, we're going to talk about data and the innovation that we're seeing around AI in general. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say it, garbage in, garbage out scenario. Yeah. What is the fundamental key to making sure data is high quality? What do you have to do? What kind of things? Do you have to have in place to make that happen? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, really tough problem, uh, especially, you know, it, in you know, uh, generally across the insurance market. I would say I, I think some of the personal lines. I came from a background where it was. Uh, uh, I worked for um, uh, Pastings Direct many years ago. Uh, price comparison websites, uh, and the, a lot of the data there was collected, obviously, by people sort of typing things into web forms already. So a lot of the data there was what I would consider to be in based on where we are in, in various companies I've worked in in the London markets and specialty in particular a lot cleaner but I think it's endemic across the whole market that you know people are really grappling with that problem I think it stems from the idea that a lot of the things that we do come from paper they come from documents personalized aggregators they don't it comes from a computerized process so and a lot of the the kind of data quality is about the correct entry the right entry into whatever policy administration or underwriting workbench, whatever tool that might be using, where you have those your CRM, CRM platform, if you have a CRM platform, it's about management of the data right back to those systems of record. And it's an operational process. Yeah. Data quality is something the data team, uh, any good data team can help you expose, can help you cleanse, can help you account for in business rules, ingestion pipelines, and things like that. We're definitely part of the solution, you know, uh, and, and, and again, that comes back to that collaboration piece. But really, fundamentally, it's about getting you know, the information out to the people who interact with the data in the systems of record and giving them the, the tools and the capabilities to either, say, not make that mistake again or have the right tools so they never make that mistake in the first place. It's simply a mistake they can't make. And I think that, that is a, that's a real... If, if an organization has to really adopt that mentality. It's not a thing the data team can resolve themselves. We can help. There's the important thing is, like all things, we can collaborate, help, and do all those other kind of things. But your, your team, team managing data quality, the output is we want to innovate, we want to build products faster, we want to be able to report to the regulator, what all of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With right. the emergence of things like Gen AI and yes. LMs and things like that, yeah. do you see any crossover there where a Gen AI could assist in that process? That's an interesting question. I. I suspect the answer is yes. I can't think of a specific, you know, uh, route off the top of my head. I mean, obviously, interactions is something a large language model. Large language model is about you know chat, and it's obviously built off you know uh, effectively a, a, a single consistent starting model, perhaps fine tuned or retrieval. It mentioned the old better generation assisted, maybe prompt engineering assisted. Um, those. So that maybe has a place. It maybe it maybe has a place, and I think there are some people doing. We've seen them around it, doing interesting things in sort of claims automation using um, GPT, uh, well, GPT large language models. Um, I think the challenge for Gen AI, um, if you ask, if you sort of ask a the, a, a techie like me, um, I, I think primarily there's a good implementation of any sort of Gen AI model has to be based upon sound sort of metrication. You know, how do you know this is doing well? How, how do you prove the value of it? How do you know it's right? Where is, where, where's your focus? Is your focus on sort of accuracy, but not necessarily speed or vice versa? How do you know, as I say, it's delivering by virtue of that metrication, the value of it? How do you ensure ground truth? Yeah, if you've got, if you've got a, a Gen AI model that's reading documents for you, and maybe it's doing some summarizing, how do you know it's doing the summarizing way? How do you know it's doing better than a human does? You know, there's, yeah, if you take an example where you might say, uh, you know, 
oh, we've taken this person and we've used some of their insights to train a summarizer or whatever that document might be. Um, how do we know that um, you've not simply replicated the problem of that person's inefficiency? How do you know you've got a good and stable sort of ground truth to begin with? Those kind of things are things that I think people are only beginning to sort of sense and get their heads around. And I think it is a complicated problem. Uh, I think anyone who's dealing with Gen AI is spending a lot of time thinking about that. That's not an answer to your data quality question, no, obviously. No, well, yeah. But that's kind of when, yeah, when, yeah. when you talk about Gen AI, I go, I think there are, I think there's a real, I think that it could be a real innovator. I think, you know, if we ever approach sort of soft market, you know, kind of conditions, I think ultimately uh, Gen AI and automation more generally is a way to provide a differentiator of value to make sure that we're not, you know, that we're effectively doing more with the same in terms of our operational costs, you know, and it's about implementing the right thing in the right place. Might be Gen AI, might be a bot, might be, you know, uh, an integration automation, might be any of those things to kind of make sure that you're competitive. And I think that's the important thing. And that's where, you know, data teams can help. Data teams are part of the solution to that. As I say, working with the, working with the, the function, the other functional teams, our partners uh, across the rest of the organization. That's a really good answer. Thank you. And I think, I think one I area, that, the final thing I wanted to sort of touch on is that there's, a lot of insurance companies, carriers, maybe even some sort of brokers are going through some transformation around data and engineering platforms, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. You've seen the best and probably the worst of it through your career. Yeah. Um, I know it's sometimes it could be a bit of a consultancy answer. It depends. But do you think having more federated resource models across data and platforms in domains is the future approach? Or do you think it'll sort of remain the same, a bit, bit more flat and nested as an IT service? I said, that's a, that's a re I do not know the answer to that. I think, you know, uh, in terms of a ways of working kind of delivery question um, for, you know, people who do adopt, say like, you know, uh, data mesh philosophies and principles and about, I can see the value of that, right? Uh, it, there's a there's a long there's a long sort of um, there's a persistent question with uh, and it's been in every company I've ever worked in about you know the question of when will the warehouse be done? The warehouse will never be done. Again, that, again, take that out of yeah. your head. The warehouse will never be done. The warehouse is uh, an analog for your business. Um, now, yeah, the core of your business doesn't doesn't will, will be developed, but your business will change. If your business isn't changing, if your business isn't growing and adapting and changing. Well, then it's stagnant. If your business is stagnant, it's dying. And all the time, or is dead. It's, you know, rules of entropy for a system, maybe. But, you know, and I think your warehouse should, your, your data, your data models and your data uh, competencies, your data, data capabilities should do the same thing. They are, part of you, they are part of your business. They are part of the way that you deliver value to your customers, to shareholders, whoever those people are. Uh, the people who own your company, whoever those people are. And it need, you need to sort of remain on top of things. So I think mesh is useful because it means that the idea of, um, it's useful. I don't think I've ever seen it done very well. No, I, but that, yeah. That's experiential. Yeah. That's not to say yeah. that it can't be done well. That's, that's purely experiment. I, I've never done mesh. But I, I think, you know, kind of the idea of saying, I have focused teams responding to domain problems who really understand not only the development but also that BAU life cycle and are able to really talk the language talk the language of their of their of their colleagues in the same domain and really are just working side by side that sounds to me that sounds quite powerful it sounds it sounds pretty good that said you know um the, a, a larger team working centrally brings scale and there's no reason they can't adopt the same philosophy and I think you know you told me not to answer it depends I think that the thing is, there's no, I would never go to a polarized, this is the only way viewpoint. I think you would find the right thing that works for your, your colleagues, your community, and the right way of implementation, the right structure, the right way of working. Very important for a leader to have that flexibility. For yeah, sure. I, I guess, and, yeah. Um, I mean, you know. Yeah, but look, no, it's been brilliant having you on. Thanks yeah. ever so much. This has been great. Thank Cheers, you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you, everybody.